Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jakob. I'm one of the gastroenterologists at Hayal Habib Center. And uh, it gives me a great pleasure to be uh, part of today's talk. So um, I just want to say, you know, these are my disclosures at the beginning. And I uh, just want to let you know, I understand it is at the end of the day. And uh, with a new and members can uh, span anywhere from eight seconds to 20 minutes. Um, and it is almost one o'clock. I'll be sure to finish within 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, Anyway, so this is the outline for today's lecture. Definition, pathophysiology, prevalence, economical impact, diagnosis, and management, okay? So let's start off, just quick background with Rome Foundation. What is Rome Foundation? Basically, it's a nonprofit organization established roughly in the late 80s, where a group of specialists meet every couple of years in a nice hotel, uh, and they look at you know, look over the literature, okay? And they try to come up with a nice diagnosis and treatment plan, so it comes in two volumes. So, you know, for functional disorders, pretty much. GERD, dyspepsia, IBS, constipation, rumination syndrome, and so on, okay? And the reason I've mentioned that is because, you know, the way we diagnose IBS is not, you know, based on a specific blood work or specific imaging test, it's mostly a symptom-based diagnostic criteria. Okay, so this is the Rome 4 criteria, so uh, came out in 2016. Rome 3 was in, you know, uh, 10 years earlier, roughly 2006. So anyway, so it's recurrent abdominal pain at least once a week for the past three months associated with two of the following. So either related to defecation, so it gets worse or it gets better with the bowel movement. So with Rome 3, it used to be, you know, get better. Now it's it could be either way. Changes tool form or frequency. Now the reason, now you might ask, okay, so how sensitive or specific is this? So, you know, just taking history to diagnose IBS. Well, they looked at it and they found that, you know, it's, uh, anywhere, so where's the laser pen? Laser pen, huh? Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. So close to 97%, you know, uh, but is it sensitive? So if someone doesn't meet all the symptoms? No, we cannot rule it out for sure. So it's 62, but it is pretty specific. So you have someone with abdominal pain, changes stool form of frequency for the past three months. You know, you can, you know, the absence of alarm features, pretty much say 97% this patient has IBS. So why is it important to be aware of this symptom-based diagnostic criteria? Uh, because, you know, this is actually an older studies that, you know, looked at sort of GPs versus specialists, gastroenterologists, and they found out, you know, like statistically significant difference, like in terms of uh, the use of the definition. So, um, you know, we as specialists, of course, we're expected to know the definition, even though it's not, you know, we expected 100%, but it's even less than that. We use the definition to diagnose IBS, but in, in, you know, like in GPs, they tend to utilize it a lot less. So we're hoping that these numbers tend to be very similar, hopefully by the end of the lecture. So. What about associated conditions? So it's very important also to note that, you know, IBS is a very complex syndrome. So it is associated with, you know, significant other comorbidities. So patients with IBS tend to have anxiety, tend to have, you know, fibromyalgia, depression, and so on. Okay, so, uh, and, you know, sometimes constipation, and, you know, so it's just important to be aware. So it's not a cause and effect, it's just association. So again, pathophysiology, again, this is a big complicated talk, even for gastroenterologists. We can spend a whole day talking about pathophysiology, but essentially it's multifactorial. You know, genetics, uh, you know, microscopic inflammation, altered bowel flora, uh, altered motility and sensitivity. But essentially this slide summarizes the pathophysiology key points here. Okay, so what is the problem with the IBS patients? So here it is. So we as physicians, we're like, okay, it's all in his head. How do I get this patient out of my office? Uh, for the patient, they tend to be very frustrated. They're like, okay, I'm being dismissed. Nobody's looking after me. It's all the same treatment, you know? So, and there's no specific diagnostic test, as I mentioned earlier, so that's the problem. Okay, so that's why it's important to be sure to explain this to the patient, okay? So, Prevalence, how common it is. And it's actually quite common, you know. So when study looked at GP primary care practice, up to 12% of their, you know, practice is IBS patient. And our, you know, uh, practice is close to 30%. So that's significantly high. Now, what about sort of uh, prevalence? How common it is? So as I said, it's, you know, 12 to 28, depending on your practice. But here's study, but using Manning criteria, so close to 20%. So it is quite common. Now, what is the problem with IBS? IBS is not a sort of a fatal disease per se, or well, it could be, but it can, you know, disease that can really affect someone's quality of life. 
Okay, so that's the problem. You know, a lot of physicians tend to dismiss that, and they say, you know, you just have IBS, it's not a big deal, just live with it, you know. But it's important to be aware that it can affect patient quality of life. This is one study that looked compared to IBD and IBS, and they found out that, you know, there's significant depression. The star essentially has a you know, significant dif difference in terms of suicide ideation and depression when it comes to IBD versus IBS patient. Okay, so just something to be aware of. And again, another study that found out that IBS patients tend to rate the quality of life a lot lower than patients with diabetes and renal disease. So you'd rather have you know, renal failure than I guess IBS. So what about economical burden? So it is a very costly disease, direct and indirect. So patients with IBS, tend to, uh, again, I apologize for the you know, busy slides and the graph, but uh, essentially, you know, these patients tend to come to the hospital over and over again. They see multiple doctors. They undergo multiple tests, you know, million dollar workup, you know, multiple medications. Plus they don't, they tend to lose days at work. They don't go to work. So again, that's pretty costly as shown here in one, econo in one Canadian study, you know, close to 6.5 billion per year. In fact, it's the fourth rank most expensive digestive disease here. And this is another study that found it's only second most expensive, 30 million, compared to hypertension. Okay, so direct and indirect costs, okay? So, you know, that's why it's important, you know, after we diagnose the patient, you know, just to, I guess, be more aware of it, you know, you know how much it can impact the health system and the patient. Uh, okay, so diagnosis, we agreed. So we have the room four criteria and uh, history and physical to look for alarm features and limited investigation. That's what you need to know when it comes to diagnosing IBS, okay? So workup, this is pretty much what you need. Limited workup, CBC, CRP, celiac serology if they have diarrhea, TSH if they have diarrhea, stool cultures, fecal cup protectin is available at our center, but not everywhere. It will tell us if the patient, it helps differentiate between inflammatory and non-inflammatory diarrhea. So that's good. But anyway, so that's, you know, these sort of investigations, limited investigations is very important. And this is also a key point, key slide here in terms of when to refer to gastroenterology. So you took history, physical, you did your investigation, you make sure the patient doesn't have any of these. If they do, just you know, put in a referral to gastro and we'll be more than happy to see that patient. So uh, anyway, so now let's go focus on the treatment uh, part. So uh, this is adapted from the American College of Gastroenterology. And this is you know, the list of treatments that's been looked at for patients with IBS. So I'll mention the recommendation and the evidence. Okay, so again, it's pretty complicated, but at least, you know, hopefully by the end of the session, you'll have an idea on how to approach patients with IBS and what's the best treatment option. Again, so apologize for the just very uh, busy slide here, but it's a nice uh, table from the American College, essentially summarizing the evidence and the recommendation and the quality of evidence, if, you know, you have the time. Uh, so let's start number one with diet. So. <laughs> Number one, there's so the specialized, di special, spe specialized diet, so gluten diet for celiac patients have been looked at, and they did notice there's improvement in patient global symptoms, pain and bloating, but again, that's based on very low quality evidence and weak recommendation, but we still, you know, recommend it, so we just refer to a dietitian. Any patient with IBS, it's reasonable to refer to a dietitian. Now, food allergy testing is not there yet, really, so we don't know what to do with that. Okay, number two is FODMAP. So this is nice, fermentable oligodye monosaccharides and polynols. There's certain food that when they're digested, they produce gas, apples, onions, garlic, you know, and, uh, uh, so, and certain vegetables. So these food, when they produce gas, patients with IBS are very sensitive. They become bloated, they're sensitive to pain, they're uncomfortable. So uh, again, there's another study that found significant difference, regular placebo versus this diet, in terms of pain and bloating improvement and urgency sensation. So dietitians should be aware of these, this type of diet or the patient can download this app on the iPhone so they're aware what type of food to avoid, you know, especially in IBS patients, okay? So, uh, number two is fiber. So fiber, especially soluble ones, again, based on good quality of evidence, weekly recommended, but also been shown to improve constipation, okay? Because they're not absorbent to the system, they retain water, and they ensure the patient have more regular spontaneous bowel movement. And again, this is another meta-analysis that compared uh, the effect of fiber in IBS, and most of them were favoring, you know, fiber versus placebo on this side. So it does work in terms of uh, improving bowel movement. Okay, next in line, so I'll summarize the sort of treatment approach at the end. I'm just talking about the evidence and recommendation for now in general. So prebiotics, probiotics, and antibiotics. So pre, pro, and anti. 
So, number one, prebiotics. Uh, Yes, they got more than their fair share recently in social media, but I just to explain, prebiotics are nutrition that tend to improve, so, I mean, theoretically, it's nutrients that promote the health of healthy bacteria in your gut. And hence, it's supposed to improve your pain, your global symptoms, and bloating part. Now, I haven't, I haven't mentioned all the studies, but essentially to summarize, this is where the American College stands. Very, very low quality of evidence and weak recommendation, we do not recommend unless you want to waste your money really okay and even if patient improve it's mostly anecdotal so I cannot just support it for all patients with IBS so we don't routinely we don't recommend it okay number two is probiotics again probiotics also expensive these are healthy bacteria uh, sort of uh, that uh, supposed to improve the health of someone bowels okay so pain and bloating uh, and there was significant difference when they used it especially for align and tuzin unfortunately these are not available in kuwait but this you know it's a probiotic capsule can improve patient global symptoms and we did prescribe it routinely you know um, you know abroad they used it pretty often but again we have other commercial probiotics i'm not sure about the evidence and how, how effective they are next would be antibiotics role of antibiotics uh, now, Urfaximin has been approved for patients with IBS diarrhea, uh, 550 TID for two weeks, only times one. And this is a follow-up study that patients still felt better in terms of diarrhea and pain and bloating uh, compared to placebo. Okay, so it does work, but we like to reserve it only for patients with IBS diarrhea because it's, again, it's expensive and, you know, you don't want resistance. And that's based on good level of evidence. But again, recommendation, the society is still very conservative about that, but we can use that. Next would be antispasmatic. Now, there's a whole group of antispasmatic I'm pretty sure you're all aware of, like Dicetel. It's mostly in private, Culpermin, private, uh, Spasmamin, uh, Disputaline, Calcium, uh, and, and sorry, and uh, Boscopan, but has anticholinergic symptoms. Now, just to summarize everything, Again, the quality of evidence is low because mostly they have a small sample size. Not all patients had strictly met the definition of IBS. They did not follow them for a long time. So there's so many limitations. That's why they said the evidence is low, but essentially, again, weak recommendation, but we still use it, okay, to control pain. Now, do I have any preference? Not really. You can use, you know, whichever is okay. I understand the spitaline is quite popular here in Kuwait, but again, Dicetel works too. Culpermin is reasonable because it's peppermint. So that's good too. So we can use any of these pretty much, okay? So, uh, okay, so for example, spasmamin, one tab three times a day as needed, dispitaline, one tablet twice a day as needed, and so on. Okay, so again, this is specifically just looking at trial, looked at spasmamin uh, versus placebo, and uh, you know, can see significant drop in sort of, with regard to improvement in abdominal pain. Uh, again, that's another study that looked at uh, spasmamin, again, you know, and other antispasmatic too, they all sort of favor treatment. Okay, so next would be peppermint. Uh, peppermint, I'm not sure if it's available, really, it's only private, really, but good quality of evidence. Uh, recommendation is still weak, uh, but again, there was significant, you know, statistically significant improvement compared to placebo. Okay, uh, so number need to treat, which, three, which is pretty good actually. Okay, so you can use peppermint if you want to control the pain now. Okay. Peg-based peg product, uh, polythene glycol, like Normacol or Laxidae or Movicol, which is available here. Again, it's, it doesn't cause dependency. You can use it for a whole, your life long. And essentially, it's not absorbed into your, these are inert substances, not absorbed to your system. They retain water. They make sure you have more spontaneous bowel movement. So again, low quality of evidence and just weekly recommended, but you can use it for the constipation part, okay? Next would be antidepressants. We tend to use or utilize these medication maybe more often than in like in your primary care practice. But again, uh, so there are two types, they're TCAs and SSRIs, okay? So tricyclic antidepressants uh, have good evidence in terms, I mean, the problem here is just the side effects, by the way, okay, which we'll talk about in a sec. But this is amitriptyline, and these are the SSRIs. So SSRIs, as you can see from these graphs, so definitely way better than, this is the, I mean, fluxetine, and placebo part okay so significant improvement with regard to abdominal discomfort and improvement in bowel movement okay and based on randomized trial good evidence there but again weekly recommended so ssris we tend to use it like ciprolax for example 10 milligrams once daily uh, but you need to use it for six to eight weeks to see improvement in pain and bowel movement so if they have constipation you can use that 
but if they have the IBS constipation type, it's better to use the tricyclic antidepressant, like we start with 10 for two weeks, then go up to, or two weeks, yeah, two weeks as tolerated, then go up to 40, for example. And uh, because of the anticholinergic effects, they tend to have, again, I apologize for the small uh, table, but essentially the, um, after one month treatment and two months treatment, pain improved and uh, sort of, uh, the bowel movement uh, improved, especially in patients with diarrhea. Okay, so SSRI tend to be more for IBS constipation because it causes diarrhea. TCA, tricyclic antidepressant, and triptyline tend to be used for IBS uh, diarrhea because anticholinergic slows things down. Again, good level of evidence, but weakly recommended. Okay, now next would be psychotherapy in IBS. Uh, Okay, let me put it this way. So, good level of evidence. It does work. Number one to treat was four. But the problem essentially, we don't have specialized, you know, psychiatrists. And a lot of them are not willing to sit down with these patients and talk to them. Because you have to be patients, really. So, uh, uh, okay. So, what about the other agents? Uh, a lot of these agents are really not available in Kuwait. Alexidiline uh, should be available in the next coming years. Approved for IBS diarrhea. So very promising drugs. Uh, again, serotonergic agents, allocitron, again, associated with ischemic colitis, but good for patient with IBS, diarrhea also in females. Uh, Prosecretary agents, we have lobeprestone, linoclotide, not available, but this should be available, hopefully in the next few years. This is essentially the best drug we have for a patient with IBS uh, with regards to improving pain and bloating and constipation, okay? And again, this is just a quick sort of, uh, Summary of all the evidence for linoclotide, 26 RCT, that showed significant improvement in, uh, compared to placebo with regards to pain and improvement in number of bowel movement. Okay, so if you're constipated, it gets better and uh, the bloating also gets better there. Okay, so let's essentially summarize what I've just you know mentioned altogether. I know it's a lot of information, but okay, so IBS, how do you diagnose it? It's a symptom-based diagnostic criteria. It's not based on imaging or a specific blood work. It's just symptom-based, room four, and limited investigations that's been mentioned prior. Uh, again, it can be very challenging to treat, you know, from primary care even to subspecialists. Uh, and the purpose of treatment, we must explain this to our patient, that we want to improve their symptoms and hence quality of life. And you, you make sure just to tell them that we don't have a cure. There's no one pill you take to that will eradicate all your symptoms. Just, it's, you know, the goal here is just to make you feel better, okay, be able to function. Okay, socially. And of course, you know, reduce the healthcare costs, which we found out earlier. It's pretty costly on the healthcare system. Okay, so, uh, so essentially, this is just the last sort of table just to summarize things in terms of IBS. It's not like, you know, asthma where there's a step up, step down approach, but um, after you make the diagnosis clinically, you make sure you classify is it constipation type, diarrhea, or mixed type. For example, if it's constipation, you recommend diet and you ask them what is the most bothersome symptoms. If it's pain, you give them antispasmatics, any of the antispasmatics mentioned. Even there's low quality behind it, but we still use it, okay? If it's constipation, we give them fiber. Doesn't work, we add Movicol. Doesn't work, we use more potent sort of stimulant laxatives, okay, as needed, okay? And finally, SSRIs, you know, mentioned or referred to a gastroenterologist. Uh, sorry, what's that? This is a bit outdated, though, so I must apologize there. So, but, you know, again, the, you know, antibiotics should be reserved here for diarrhea type, pretty much, okay? So, because it helps the diarrhea and the global symptoms. You can use antibiotics, and, you know, because it tends to alter the flora, people do report improvement. But again, it costs antibiotic resistance. Evidence is not that great, okay? But it's symptom-based management, and we must explain, we must set realistic expectation, like what to expect from the treatment. I cannot cure you, but I can make you maybe feel better, okay? That's the key point here. And uh, that's pretty much it.